Spirit of God who descended upon Jesus in his baptism, who inspired his words and animated his ministry, fall upon us today, that these words of Scripture might show us what we are to do as your people today in your world. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. Let us listen now for God's word to us this day. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And in the New Testament, we read from the Gospel of Luke, uh, continuing our reading in chapter 4, where we left off last week, As Jesus has begun his ministry in Galilee and has gone to the synagogue in Nazareth on the Lord's on the Sabbath day uh, and has read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do also hear in your hometown hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the great ends of the church is the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, as we say it. Gospel means good news, and what couldn't be good about God's plan to save the world? But sometimes the good news we proclaim is also challenging news, and sometimes it may be so challenging that it sounds at first like bad news. This was the problem for the congregation at the synagogue in Nazareth. It is very likely that the congregation was angry with Jesus from the start, or at least within the first few moments after Jesus began to read from the Isaiah scroll. Our traditional English translations depict a pleased congregation that quickly turns into an angry, murderous mob. But you know, the Greek doesn't really say they spoke well of Jesus. 
Rather, it simply says they witnessed him. The Greek is ambiguous about whether they witnessed for Jesus or against him. So the translator has to decide when translating this passage whether the synagogue audience liked what Jesus said or disliked it, and then translate accordingly, either as all spoke well of him, as we read this morning, or all witnessed against him. It is quite likely they were angry from the start. Why? Because when Jesus reads from the scroll of Isaiah, he plays around with a very popular text. To our ears, unfamiliar as we are with the full text of Isaiah, Jesus' message sounds harmless and even quite wonderful. But Jesus has left out some key phrases from Isaiah that the people of Nazareth, who knew this text quite well, were not only expecting to hear, but looking forward to hearing and relishing. They are the phrases that dole out vengeance on the Gentiles. Isaiah does indeed say, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me to bring good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But Isaiah also, also proclaims the day of vengeance of our God. And that the Gentiles shall stand and feed your flocks, that foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines, and you shall enjoy the wealth of the Gentiles, and in their riches you shall glory. But Jesus leaves out all this material about the Gentiles getting what's coming to them, and the people of Nazareth are none too pleased. You see, in Jesus' time, a form of Jewish nationalism had sprung up which used the tactic of moving Jewish settlers in from Judea into the Gentile territory. The village of Nazareth was one of these settlers' villages in what Isaiah had called Galilee of the Gentiles. That means that the people of Nazareth would have been intensely nationalistic, and they would have felt a bit threatened by the Gentiles who lived very nearby. In fact, if we turn to the Aramaic translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, which is called the Targum, we find a sort of expanded version of this text from Isaiah. The Targum translated, this translation actually added a few choice phrases to the Hebrew, so that it reads, You shall eat the possessions of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall be indulged. Instead of being ashamed and confounded, Two for one, the benefits I promise you, I will bring you, and the Gentiles will be ashamed who were boasting in their lot. This is what the people of Nazareth expected God to do for them and against the Gentiles. So Jesus, the local boy, comes to his hometown synagogue, knowing full well the views held by this community about their Gentile neighbors. And with everyone listening intently, he chooses this familiar and deeply beloved passage. But to their shock, he stops reading at the very points at which judgment and servitude are pronounced upon the Gentiles. Then, having made these alterations to the messianic vision, he, the one dearly held by his hometown congregation, Jesus announces that this new messianic age has just begun in their hearing. So they ask, what is all this gracious talk toward the Gentiles? Is not this Joseph's son? Did he not grow up right here in Nazareth? Does he not know that this city was, why this city was founded in the first place? And understanding exactly how his words will be heard, Jesus doesn't let up, but turns the screws even further. He says, I know you will want me to perform healings here as I have elsewhere, but I won't because you will not accept my message. And as if that is not enough to make the people's blood boil, he presses even further by telling two stories from the Old Testament, one about Elijah and one about Elisha, but both about God's blessing and healing of Gentiles. Not just because God was gracious to them, but because these Gentiles exhibited true faith. New Testament scholar Kenneth Bailey summarizes Jesus' teaching in this way. If you want to receive the benefits of the new golden age of the Messiah, Jesus tells them, you must imitate the faith of these Gentiles. 
I am not asking you merely to tolerate or accept them, but you must see such Gentiles as your spiritual superiors and acknowledge that they can instruct you in the nature of authentic faith. The benefits of the acceptable year of the Lord, which I have come to inaugurate, are available to such people. Jesus does indeed proclaim the good news about the grace of God, but there is a sharp edge to this grace where the people of Nazareth are concerned. Or you might say Jesus' proclamation of God's grace pushes them over the edge, and so that is exactly what they decide they're going to do to Jesus. Although to say they decided might be giving them a little too much credit since it sounds like less like a considered decision and more like a, a mob scene, a riot in which an enraged crowd caught up in violent religious fervor rise up, drive Jesus out of town, lead him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they might hurl him off the cliff. The picture on the front of your bulletin. But the uh, cliffhanger doesn't last long. As Jesus, in a foreshadowing of the cross and the resurrection, slips through the midst of this murderous crowd and continues on his way. Now, this is a tricky passage for us today. You can imagine the preacher's discomfort in seeing it appear in the lectionary during a season of intense front page presidential campaign rhetoric that is currently laser-focused on the question of how we in America are going to treat outsiders, in particular refugees, many of whom are Muslim, some of whom are from Syria. We have to be careful in our interpretation here because while there are some very interesting and challenging points of convergence, the situation in Nazareth then and our situation in the world today are by no means precisely parallel. There are several things that need to be said here. First, the gospel of Jesus Christ that we proclaim today is still about proclaiming God's kingdom, which is a political reality or has political implications. Proclaiming Christ as the Messiah who brings that kingdom into existence has implications. The gospel is about good news for the poor and for all who are humbled by life, which means it is about advocating for justice for those who are politically, socially, and religiously oppressed. And it is about showing compassion for those who are in need of help and healing. And if we are to take our lead from Jesus, the good news is about the wideness of God's mercy. Mercy which breaks out beyond our boundary lines, be they theological or social or economic or national. God's love and mercy know no bounds. Perhaps it's obvious, but let's just name it. In this story, we are not supposed to side with the hometown folks, but with Jesus. We all want to be on Jesus' side in this confrontation. We do not want to be grouped up with the self-satisfied, self-congratulatory, self-righteous religious people whose main goal is to protect their chosen status and the blessing that they expect to come with it. So whenever we get our dander up, when we feel our blood beginning to boil, when we perhaps even feel rage welling up within us, as did these folks in Nazareth, we need to ask what it is we feel is threatening us and whether we are misdirecting our fear and our anger. At the same time, we always have to be careful when we side with Jesus. Because siding with Jesus can lead us to recreate our very own version of self-congratulation and self-appointed specialness. Particularly when it leads us to point the finger at those in our own day who we think are not on Jesus' side. It's a fine line, isn't it? Over the past year, I've been writing and speaking in our denomination about the, way, the ways we advocate for justice. I've been one of a number of voices calling us away from loud pronouncements at the General Assembly level that have the effect of alienating half or more of the Presbyterians in our land. 
And I've been advocating instead that we strive for local conversations where we must sit face to face with our conversation partners. I'm not suggesting these local conversations are any easier necessarily, but perhaps we'd be more likely to honor one another as people of good faith due to the proximity of our eyes and our ears and our voices and our breathing and our living together. As might be expected in a culture of polarizing rhetoric, it has been insinuated or even directly stated that we who are calling for these reforms are soft on Nazis or unsympathetic to the cause of Martin Luther King or even not quite fully human uh, since our approach to justice issues was called Neanderthal. So I want you to know that your preacher understands what it feels like to be rhetorically bullied and to be told shame, shame for not being on Jesus' side. And that's why I want to be careful preaching a passage like this and in talking about how we treat refugees or immigrants who cross our borders today, be they Muslim or Christian or any other faith tradition. On the one hand, we cannot in good conscience take the approach of lumping all Muslims into one category as if by being Muslim they threaten the well-being of all Christians and all peace-loving people. To think this is to ignore what the majority of Muslims are actually saying about their faith. On the other hand, we do live in a time where there are groups and individuals with radical, militant ideologies who pose an actual threat. There are terrorists and murderers, and some of them claim a religious mandate. Some claim to be murderous in the name of Islam, as in San Bernardino. Some, we have to admit the facts, claim to kill in the name of Christianity, as in Colorado Springs. So there is an understandable reticence among many faithful Christians who love Jesus and his kingdom and who want to open their arms wide in mercy and compassion to all people, and yet who are not quite ready to trust every person who might walk into our midst under the name of refugee. So here's where you might be ready to throw me off the cliff. I'm not Jesus, but... I think this is another one of those social and political issues that we are called to talk about in our congregations. Some of you might want to throw me off the cliff because you're worn out from talking about controversial topics. Others because you're ready to move beyond mere talking and into action in one way or another, regardless of what your brothers or sisters think. But I would suggest that our greatest witness as a Christian community in this context might be our ability to speak and listen with one another in love around these difficult questions. We cannot really avoid such matters as they pertain directly to how we are to live Jesus' mission today. To say that our Christian faith is not about such issues would be to avoid the very political nature of Jesus' own proclamation in his context. We might prefer to retreat and spiritualize all of Jesus' teaching, but that would be not only, I think, a disingenuous interpretation of Scripture, but an unfortunate denial of the relevance of the Christian faith to the most important issues of our day. We proclaim the grace of God in Jesus Christ, and there is an edge to that grace because that grace comes to us via the word of God, which is sharper than a two-edged sword. It is our calling to pray together and talk together and honor God by honoring one another in all of our diversity as we seek to discern what it means for Jesus to say, today, today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. May the good news be fulfilled among us that we may walk with Jesus on the cutting edge of grace.